Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's lovely to have you again for yet another session of Centering the SDGs Youth Voices. Uh, just a little reminder that at Mission 4.7, I'm going to be pasting our link, the link to our event list so you can see other stuff that is coming up as well if you would like to participate. Um, the Center for Sustainable Development believes in youth voices, and that is why we have given the platform to this youth conference. We have had over, I don't even know how many panels in the past two weeks, but it's been great. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our eco ambassador, Aluk, that will be given an expert interview to Suguru Misunoya. So please go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Mora. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I would like to introduce my esteemed panelists. Dr. Suguru Minzunoya is a senior advisor of statistics and monitoring education with UNICEF headquarters. He oversees UNICEF's progress in education, SDG4 monitoring, education data generation, analysis, and capacity development. He leads the MICS Eagle Education Analysis for Global Learning and Equity since 2019. Prior to this, he has worked as the acting director of the Global Political Econ Economy Program at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Chief of Education of UNICEF Kenya, Dr. Mizunoya has a PhD and MPhil deg degree in economics and education, and education from Teachers College, Columbia University, and a Master of International Affairs from the School of Columbia University, from the School of International Public Affairs, SIPA, Columbia University, and a bachelor's degree in human sciences from the University of Tsukuba, Japan. He has written extensively on education policies about out of school children, education finance, inclusive education, as well as social policy issues, including social protection and, and in universal healthcare financing. And so my first question is, what are some of the challenges you face in collecting data related to the SDGs? Okay, thank you very much, Aluk. And, the, and also thank you very much for a really nice introduction. So your question is about the challenges uh, that we face in collecting data. And the, I think one big challenge in collecting STG data is that the, uh, the, the range and quality of data required is much, much higher at a higher level compared to the data required to monitor MDGs. Uh, for education, there are 11 indicators and, and many of them are new, newly introduced. And when the SDG um, effort started in 2015, many of the indicators were not very vague, vaguely defined. So the colleagues in UNICEF, UNESCO, World Bank, we had to discuss how exactly measure these indicators. So the, the whole data collection started with a challenge, technical challenge, how we define our indicators. And then, for example, so when the, we had MDG, a global community focused on access to education, which is rather easy to measure. You know the number of students in school and you know the child population. So basically you can calculate share of children attending school for primary, lower secondary and upper secondary. And, the, and we have made, the world has made a lot of progress. And so a lot of children are in school now. So the, the focus has shifted to measure learning outcome. So the first indicator, global indicator for SDG in education is, is about accessing, but also the quality of education, which is measured by learning outcome. So now question is how do we measure learning outcome across countries? at different levels of education, at the beginning of primary, at the end of primary, and at the end of uh, lower secondary. And we want to compare uh, or monitor across the world. So these indicators were new and they, they are not simple. So it's simple. So there were technical challenges and of course the capacity challenges because they are new indicators and also financial challenges. And so we are now in 2022 after seven years. And the, I have to say we have made a great progress. progress. 
um, if we compare where we were in 2015. So, okay, in a nutshell, the, what kind of challenges we had, a, a lot of challenges, different challenges, technical challenge, capacity challenge, and also the resource challenges. But I think we have made great progress and we know much better than before um, in terms of the how many, for example, children do not have minimum uh, uh, academic skills in reading and uh, numeracy around the world. Okay, so um, given the challenges that you've mentioned, how do countries collect this data and how, do they, and how often do they share it with you? Um, how do country collect data depends on the indicator. For example, the, the, the indicator um, related to access can be obtained from the administrative system, what we call EMIS, Education Management and Information System, which is an administrative uh, education system, uh, which is very common. And so basically when a child go to school, the head teacher record, and then they send uh, the compiled data to the Ministry of Education or Department of Education, and then they summarize data and they publish education statistics. So, and then they do this every year. When it comes to, for example, the learning assessment, it may not be every year. In some countries, every year. But some countries, for example, rely on international or regional assessment. I don't know if you have heard PISA, which is uh, the learning assessment, uh, international learning assessment organized by OECD. And it's done every three years or four years. And so if, if a country database, data sources is PISA, then you have to wait two, two or three years for you to collect that indicator. So uh, the, the frequency of data collection depends on which indicator you are looking for. But um, um, yeah, uh, depends on the, the indicator you are looking for. At the same time, however, some colleagues are working to model, meaning if you know the past trend, you can have a very good guess estimation for this year. In that sense, if even if you don't have data, we can guess how much the, the value should be for this year. So depending on, that's not done in education uh, very much, but that's done in other areas, for example, child mortality. Is PISA conducted in every country in the world or just some countries? Mm -hmm. Is PISA conducted in every country? Oh, in the PISA, world? I th yeah, I think it, it's around 8,200 countries. Um, the, I think the past one was 80 plus, and the next one will be around 100. It started for the high income countries, OECD countries, but they tried to expand. And the, so uh, in the last PISA, uh, they had a special program called PISA uh, for development, PISA D, and to which uh, low income countries and lower middle income countries participated, such as Cambodia or the Senegal. So the, the coverage is expanding nowadays. Okay. So what are some of the ways in which the data collected helps with the implementation of SDG4 and what do the current SDG4 trends suggest? Implementation of SDG4, uh, what, what, I wasn't really sure what you meant by implementation for SDG4, like in the actualization of SDG4 goals. Yes, right? yes. so in, in many countries, um, the education sectors have national education plan. Right? So then the, so you have, you are in a country and then you have a national education plan. It's a plan, therefore you should have a target. You, you should have the situation analysis and then based on the situation, you want to achieve something, right? And then the, so for that target, very often SDG4 targets are used. For example, let's, uh, there should be no children behind, left behind in terms of accessing to education. So that means the, access to education should be 100% for all children in that country. And then when they have new SDG4 data, 
they know where they are against their target. So, so SCG4 data are quite, uh, I mean, important, not quite super important uh, for a country to monitor the progress and also understand where they where they left behind and what kind of uh, acceleration um, and additional additional uh, efforts are needed. Okay, so do the trends suggest that like the implement the actualization is like at a good pace or are some or some countries like lagging behind? Like what's the what's the what's the shape of the world in this, in yeah. this state? Yeah, it, it really depends on the indicator. Right. And for example, if we look at um, access to education, attendance rates or enrollment rates for primary, it has improved significantly. When I was a kid uh, at your age, the, the global narrative was that there are so many millions of children can't go to even primary school. Look at Africa. The situation is, is like hopeless. That was a narrative. 1990, there was a global conference in Thailand, Jong Tien, to, to create a global commitment to improve access to education. So that was narrative in the late 80s and 90s. But if you look at the uh, statistics today, uh, nine out of 10 children around the world are attending primary education. Of course, still one out of 10 is not accessing, which is a huge problem. But if you compare where we are today to the situation 20, 30 years ago, we have made great progress. However, I said it depends on the indicator, right? So learning assessment, learning outcome is not improving. There are so many millions of children graduating uh, primary school or lower secondary school without minimum skills in reading and writing. So the quality education uh, has not been improved much yet and we need to accelerate that very much. And when it comes to, for example, 4.7 uh, global citizenship, PC education, human rights, we are, they, they are more much more um, uh, delayed in terms of achieving the goal. So there are different pictures within the SDG for monitoring framework. Right. Okay, so in the recent State of the Global Education Crisis, a path to recovery report, which is produced jointly by UNESCO, UNICEF, and the World Bank, it found it was found that this generation of students risks losing $17 trillion in their lifetime earnings in present value, or about 14% of global GDP because of COVID-19 related school closures and economic shocks. This new projection far exceeds the 10 trillion estimate reached in 2020 and reveals that the impact of the pandemic is more severe than previously estimated. Do you have data on how COVID has affected foundational skills in students around the world and what measures are being taken to address these gaps? Yes, uh, so the, these estimations are done by colleagues in the World Bank and we have been working together World Bank with the World Bank and UNESCO. And as you mentioned, they at the beginning of the pandemic, they estimated foregone earning loss. So that way they calculated was that if there were no COVID, we assume X million or billion uh, children will go to lower secondary, upper secondary, and the tertiary education in coming years. But many of them dropped out or the, the duration of the education gets reduced. So then their future earning will be less. Can we estimate the gap between the hypothetical two scenarios? One, there was no COVID. Now, the, based on certain assumptions about the job part, we assume the X million of children will go to, well, will drop out from global secondary. And then what would be that gap in terms of the total earning of all the children today? That's how they uh, measured. And so that was simulation, but we, there, we, we have a lot of evidence produced uh, uh, last, uh, around the end of last year and this year to document exact uh, degree of uh, learning loss in many countries. We don't, I don't think we have a global estimate yet, but there are many, many case studies. Um, so the learning loss is real, 
and then we there will be a, a global uh, reports in uh, published in in uh, next week on uh, March thirtieth. That would um, that that's our report, UNICEF report that highlights the the magnitude of learning loss and also the magnitude of the uh, program interventions to mitigate or the recoup the learning loss. Um, so that report will be published next week, 30th of March. At the same time, um, the, there will be another report issued by UNICEF, World Bank and UNESCO, which um, monitor, which prov um, present a snapshot of efforts made by ministries of education around the world if they are taking actions to address learning loss. And then so and, and in, in, the, in, in the learning recovery, what we recommend is that the stop closing school, bring children into school, because we have seen evidence, enough evidence that learning at home is not the best way to to provide education for major for the majority of children in the world, and the two, and then second recommendation is to provide remedial studies. Now children will come back to school, but the, the variation in terms of learning outcome in the classroom will be wider. Some children had great experience learning experience at home, even schools was closed. So they, there is no learning loss, but some other children may have suffered much more because, uh, because maybe they don't have, for example, their good internet or maybe PC, maybe parents are busy because they lost job because of COVID. So the situation, um, family situation is, 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 is very different across uh, students. So therefore you will have very as children with uh, different learning levels coming back to school. So what's important for education is that the, the teachers provide um, teaching at the level they understand. So remedial education is very important. That's what we have been uh, proposing. And for that, of course, we need to support teachers because it's new for them. And then we, the, uh, Ministry of Education or education stakeholders should support teachers so that they can adjust their teaching to the new reality that they are facing. Right, so um, I have a question. Um, are developing countries being disproportionately impacted by these COVID closures or are developed countries also feeling a, a great impact? Um, the the developed Developing countries, like low income countries, lower income countries, lower middle income countries, uh, I would say have been affected more disproportionately. When schools are closed, how could students continue to learn? They, the ministries of education around the world provided remote learning education, remote learning through different channels. In America, the US or high income countries, internet based remote learning was very common. And you can, it comes with challenges. Um, I, I live in New York and my son goes to public school and a teacher, my son, my son is the, um, the grade six. A teacher was very experienced. Um, and so my son was able to learn throughout the school closure. However, when I talked to the teacher and, and told him that, you know, you, you must be, it must be very tough for you to teach kids through the uh, online. And he said, yes, I've been teaching 20 years, but it has never been this difficult. Like, so even if you have internet, teaching kids through internet, it's very dif difficult, especially if you're teaching smaller children, it might be easier for like university students, maybe it's okay. But for smaller children, it's definitely uh, difficult. But that's the best case scenario. Like it's, it's PC, it's internet. In low income countries, very often they use TV. So it's a one way communication. The Ministry of Education say on Tuesday, nine o'clock, we will broadcast math uh, lessons for grade three. 
right? And then you have to be there and you can't ask questions. And you have to just listen. And then there is no guarantee that you can listen to that broadcast because you may have multiple, I mean, you may have siblings and they may need to take other lessons. They want, may want to see other channels, but you only have one TV. In other countries, they use radio. So no visual, you just need to listen in. So maybe it's okay if you learn, let's say history, but how could you learn mathematics through radio? And maybe it's possible, but it's, it's gonna be super difficult. So those, in addition to that, right? You need, for example, have to have power system in your house, which is, standard for the families in high income countries, but there are so many millions of children who don't have power at home, right? So, so for these reasons, children in low income countries are uh, much more disproportionately affected by the school closure. Okay. So can you tell us something about the learning recovery programs? Yes, learning recovery is basically bringing children to school. So no more school closures. We know COVID is not going to affect children seriously like the elderly. And we know the, the attending school is good for kids for learning outcomes, but also development outcomes and socializations and developing the social emotional skills. And so that's one. And second one is to provide uh, remedial studies and you teach um, content based on students' uh, understanding. So you need teachers have to adjust a little bit so that the children can catch up. Right? So that these are two very important uh, yeah, ingredients of uh, learning recovery. Right. And um, how important is it for governments to implement a systems approach to addressing gaps in education and healthcare? Yeah, this is a great, great uh, question. And, um, I, I was wondering why, where did you pick up this system approach? Um, is it, I, I don't think it's a very common <laughs> way to look at things for, for I have attended like uh, many of these conferences. So I guess mm. I, I don't remember which particular, like through the Earth Institute, I don't remember which particular conference I picked it up mm. though, but it, it, I think it was one of them. Yeah, I think system approach is, is, is quite important in terms of, uh, equity and effectiveness and efficiency. Right? Uh, the, it, it's much easier to reach out, for example, children in urban areas. And if you don't have a system approach, I wouldn't deny to start with issues that can be solvable and easy to address, low hanging fruits, I, I wouldn't deny. But if we always do that, if we don't have the mindset that system approach is important, there will be always children left out. So, you, and also there is a the sustainability issue. Okay, the, the maybe leaders come up with, with a project to address very specific issues in very specific area. And then just that year, but in the long run, nothing will change. Right. So the system approach will help you to make sure that the, your program reach everybody. And also it's system, therefore it won't be just this year's program, but it's next year's program. Program So that the system approach is a very important approach to ensure equity. And also it's, it's, it's efficient because you create a system. And so the, the, you must need to, you, you need to make investment, right? Like you, for example, in, like collecting data, from, from uh, schools, you have to create a system, but once you have data, then you can collect data every year from all the schools, right? And then also it, it helps you to, to, um, at, to go at scale, scale, right? For example, like if you, if let's say the government needs to provide a laptop, right? buying 100 laptop at the par, uh, the unit cost, the cost of one laptop would be reduced if you order 1000, right? So there could be a lot of uh, efficiency gain by address, by creating the, uh, the uh, 
kind of a program at the uh, system level. Um, and, and this is something there, I think there is a lot of ways that tension between system approach and innovation because innovation is never be a, at a scale from the beginning. Innovation will be small. It's not systemic approach, but important. And then system approach is kind of like things everybody know it's heavy, it's slow, but it's very robust. So I think working in UNICEF, I always feel kind of how best I or we should balance between the innovation and the system approach. And we do both all the time. We do both all the time. I like your point about like how you were talking about um, the need for a system of for systems of scale to increase efficiency plus innovation. That that's the best way to like um, implement like the implement these goals in like the quickest amount of time possible, mm. and then to hit more people. Yeah, and then there there are a lot of innovations, and it's just I mean like we we should study more. Like we should learn what's happening around the world more. And because it's so fast paced and the, a lot of innovation comes from very young generations, including yours. And um, it, it, it's a great, great thing, great thing. And so when we talk about the, I think many narratives in education has shifted a lot the last few years or at least like five years. I think we are more keen to learn from public sector, uh, private sectors and also the, um, the uh, the education technology has been a quite quite big issue for for us to do anything. So that wasn't the case like ten years ago. So innovation definitely important, but at the same time we need to work at a system level so that we can ensure that all the children have access to quality education. True. Anyways, thank you so much. I think that was my that was my last question. Thank, okay. It was great to meet you, Mr. Minsonoya, Dr. Minsonoya. Sorry. <laughs> It was really nice talking to you. I'm, I'm, I enjoy talking to you. And um, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for being here.